and welcome to the Casual Cinecast, powered by Cinelinks. My name is Chris. My name is Justin. And my name is Mike. Today's episode will be going over what's on our minds, followed by a recap of all the Mission Impossible films so far, leading up to Mission Impossible Fallout. So join us. Your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to join us. I should have known that was coming from you. It's probably going to happen five more times throughout this podcast, so yeah. count them. Yeah. Are we asking anybody else to do anything in this episode? Probably. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, so if you want to ask us any questions about Mission Impossible Fallout before we do our show on it next week, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Casual Cinecast. You can also join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Casual Cinecast, or you can email us directly at casualcinemedia at gmail.com. Absolutely. And do not forget to get on either Twitter or Facebook and vote on our new poll for which theme you would like the next Casually Criterion episode to be about. So far, we've got yeah. Mission Impossible themes on cruising, espionage, and if you choose to accept it. I think there's a clear winner there, guys. Uh, it's if you choose to accept it, and go ahead and go vote for that one. Cruising's pretty good, too. I like yeah. it. Yeah, but espionage doesn't really rely on a pun. It's so confident. It's like when a it's like when a restaurant names itself Hamburger Restaurant, and you kind of just want to <laughs> eat like, there. That's what it does. All right, so you guys ready to move into what's on our mind? Yes. Let's do it. All right, so who wants to go first? I'll go first. So this week, uh, I caught up on every Mission Impossible movie, uh, which was a lot of fun, and uh, there were a lot of them were a lot better than I remembered, or good on a second viewing. So I was really excited to do that, and we'll talk a lot more about that later on in this episode. But I did see another movie called uh, Leave No Trace. Oh, nice with Ben Leave- Foster, right? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, so it stars Ben Foster and uh, Thomason McKenzie, and they're a father-daughter that are living on the land in like a national forest. Towards the very beginning of the movie, they get caught, and things unfold from there. Oh, wow. I had no idea what this movie was based on the title or the poster. I remember I've seen the trailer for it, and mm-hmm. so, ah, that movie. Yeah. I, I think if I had seen this movie a week ago, it could very well be on my top five of the year so far. Uh, it's shot really well. Ben Foster and Thomas and McKenzie kill it. There, there's a moment where Ben Foster's face, you know everything that's happening inside of his head just based on looking at him. And it's he's so good in this. And you know, for those of you that have seen Ben Foster and other things like Hell or High Water, he is so different. Like he's such a great actor that he just he nails it. And Thomas and McKenzie is really really great in it as well. In the middle of this film, I was thinking to myself, I was like, how can I be so enthralled in this movie when there's so very little happening in it? You know, there's very little plot, very little action, very little music even. But I was so wrapped up in it and tense. Uh, I just loved it. If if you guys, if it's playing close by, go see it. Uh, do yourself a favor. All right. Will do. Yeah, that's awesome. I like uh, Ben Foster. He's always good. I've liked him since that not very good movie that came out. Like in 2001 with Tim Allen and Johnny Knoxville <laughs> yeah. and Tom Sizemore. Big and, Trouble? Uh, yeah, Big Trouble. With, that movie's it, not good? I remember it fondly. Well, I like it, but looking back on it, my gut instinct tells me it's not good. But uh, I don't know. You know? It has Tom Sizemore and Johnny Knoxville in it and Tim <laughs> Allen. <laughs> That's at least one really great ingredient if you ask me. I know, but usually that doesn't spell good movies. So yeah, I don't I, know. If you guys have seen Big Trouble recently, let me know. It's also got Jason Lee. <laughs> My first Ben Foster experience was Hostage, which is for sure not a good movie oh, with yeah. Bruce Willis. With and... Bruce Willis, yeah. But Ben Foster's um, always good, even when his movies are no good. Yeah, yes, when I saw I, him in uh, something else, I immediately recognized him as the guy from Hostage because he had made an impression <laughs> on me. Yeah, have either one of you guys seen Winter's Bone? It's uh, from the same director as Winter's Bone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Winter's Bone's yeah. great. This movie, it's it's really good. Awesome. So, yeah, go see it. How about you, Justin? What have you been up to? Yeah, so I've watched a lot. And I've picked just one since we have kind of a long episode talking about a bunch of other movies. And I decided to watch a film that I've been wanting to see for a while just because the word of mouth of this film is so 
crazy, I guess. I just see it everywhere all the time. And that film is The Wicker Man. And that's the Nicolas Cage version, not the original version. And I, I guess it's everywhere because people constantly hate on Nicolas Cage and talk about how bad he is in, as an actor. And I guess this movie uh, by the transitive property or something is also bad. It's got that famous clip that's been passed around on the internet for a long time of them putting like a helmet of bees on him or something. Yeah. And the, the bee CG is not great. Right. And it gets weird. And I don't, I don't know how I would react if I was in a helmet full of bees. Yeah. It's, but it's a hard thing to act, I imagine. So I, I say all that to say that I actually mostly enjoyed this movie. I don't think it's nearly as bad as people say it is. And I don't think Nicolas Cage is anywhere close to bad in it. I think he's actually pretty good. Is that why you liked like, it? Relatively speaking. Because you were expecting something so terrible? Or is it? Or do you think it's actually like you would have felt that way had you not been expecting something terrible? I'm not sure. I mean, it's hard to be sure, I guess. Yeah. You know, I might have to watch it again in a while, like let it sit for a while and get used to the way I think about it now and watch it again and, and see what I think. But it's it's pretty interesting. Like what is going on is interesting. I think the last third of the film is where it kind of teeters back towards being not as good. But the mystery and the suspense up until that point like kept me interested the whole time. Have you and, seen the original Wicker yeah. Man? No, I haven't. I, haven't I have a friend either. who lent it to me I, I've probably seen a year ago, and I still just have it and haven't watched it. But I it, want to it's now. It's good. Yeah, Everyone says the original is really great. Yeah, I really like the the original. It's it's good and creepy. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, but and I guess the the reason I chose to talk about it is just because I want to put some opposite feelings out there that are than the ones that are out there because there's a lot of hate towards this movie and towards Nick Cage and I think it's not that bad. I think Nicolas Cage is generally a good actor and I try to stick up for him whenever I can. Sure, Nicolas Cage is absolutely wonderful in Leaving Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's great in that Raising Arizona. Yeah, Raising Arizona is fantastic. Uh, So Nicolas Cage, he has his moments. I think acting is a job to him more than anything. So he's not precious with what he's in. No. Right. Which is really a shame. But, you know, I I imagine if you have to act for a living, sometimes it's going to be really hard to say no to like, uh, oh, man, what is that? Season of the Witch, right? Or yeah, yeah. Or uh, Left Behind. Left Behind. Oh God. Did you, oh, that's did, right. He did I forgot left, about this. He did do a Left Behind. Oh, gross. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's he's got to pay for his island. You know, I bet you the mortgage on that's pretty high. Probably. Did you? He owns an island. Does he really? I knew he was in like a crazy amount of debt a few years ago. Yeah, like he had to declare bankruptcy or something along those lines. Yeah. yeah. Undoubtedly, that's part of it. I would assume. <laughs> yeah, you don't Islands need an aren't island. Cheap. No. No. <laughs> Unless he was trying to recreate the island from The Wicker Man and just have a bunch of women on it. Does The Wicker Man take place on an island? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Have you not seen uh, either version, I guess? No, I guess not. Uh, yeah. I, well, I didn't talk about the story, I guess, because it, it just seems so well known amongst like the movie community. But it is a, about him where he plays a cop and this ex-fiance uh, of his sends him a letter saying that her child has gone missing. So he goes out to where she is and it's this island full of women run by women. And like the only guys you ever see aren't allowed to speak and are just kind of doing physical labor, basically sort of slave-ish. And yeah, that's hmm. that's kind of all I'll say. Huh. Yeah, I had no idea what that movie was about. That's the setup. So if that sounds interesting to you, watch it. All right, well, there you go. Apparently, it's not so bad. I might, I might even say good. I, I want to caveat that by saying that I, I want to watch it again, but I might say that it's actually on the like six, six, six and a half out of 10 side of being good. I also think you need to try the original. I haven't seen the second one, but the original is really good. So I probably need to watch the remake so I can compare them. But I, I yeah. think the original, try the original, see how you like that one. Okay. But make sure there's a, there's like several versions out there of the original and one's really edited down, so make sure you can find the uh, the unedited version. Oh, I hate that nonsense. Yeah, because there's a lot of nudity in it and back then in the 70s when it was made. They cut it out. I remember Dang. there was a Western that took me a long time to find an unedited version of called China 9, Liberty 37. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. I'm sorry. That's it for me. That's all I got this week. So you're up, Mike. All right. So this week I watched a comedy from earlier this year. 
starring John Cena, Leslie Mann. No, not Leslie. Is it Leslie Mann? Is that her name? It is Leslie Mann. Yeah. Okay. Who was I thinking of? Who's that woman from Ghostbusters? Kate McKinnon? No. The one named Leslie. Oh, Leslie Jones? Maybe. Yeah. Anyway, it's too many Leslies. What was it talking about? Oh, yeah. Locks. Thank goodness Leslie Nielsen died not that long ago, or we'd be real confused. Yeah, <laughs> we'd be in a pickle. <laughs> um, Just kidding. Not thank goodness that he died. I don't merely mean that. But anyways, have you guys seen Blockers? Yes, I have. I watched it not that long ago. Yeah, unfortunately, I haven't seen it yet, so... Yeah. Well, this movie is actually pretty good. Uh, So this is about three teenage girls who want to lose their virginity on prom night, and their parents find out about it and do their best to stop this from happening, basically. To block them. Yeah, to block them, if you will. But anyways, this movie is better than it sounds. Yeah, like John Cena's really funny in it, which is... So funny. I was yeah. impressed. Uh, he was the best part of Trainwreck, and he is still on a roll. He's well aware of who he is, what he looks like, and you know what he's capable of. So he can come up with some really, really great moments. Yeah, I got a big kick out of just looking at him sometimes, like the outfits that they put him in. Oh, I know. And then sometimes it's even funnier uh, during scenes whenever he has to take off his clothes. And then you just see this, like, man who's just entirely too muscular to be, right? Like, like he can't even move right. He can't put his arms down all the way. Like, his thighs brush up against one another when they're walking. He's just an awkward thing that is hilarious to watch. (laughs) And, uh, yeah, I think he's a breakout. For sure. I also think the other guy that is in the movie, whose name I'm blanking on. Oh, um, Ike Barinholtz. Yes, him. He's really good, too. He yeah. surprised me as well. It, it, when the movie started, I thought he was, he sort of looked like a poor man's Mark Wahlberg. And I <laughs> yeah, thought, he does. I thought that might be what was going to happen to be like sort of a Mark Wahlberg type performance or something. Like they wanted him for the movie originally and couldn't mm-hmm. get him. But he does his own thing in it, and he's really really funny like he's he's as as funny as john cena is he's kind of the star to me he's the one i walk away remembering the most yeah this isn't just you know another american pie this movie actually is very sweet so sweet yeah there's a lesson learned at the end by pretty much every character everyone grows a little bit it has a very nuanced progressive approach to the subject matter Mm -hmm. um there's even a point where you know one character asks another character you know why is sex such a big deal and it's just a really profound moment, I think. It's directed by Kay Cannon, and I think she does a wonderful job in this. And I think having it directed by a woman about three girls wanting to lose their virginity was a smart idea, to be honest with you. And I think it's all the better for it. Yeah, it feels like she knows both sides of this, right? Like, Oh, yeah. Both being having been a girl at some point, wanting to lose her virginity, or thinking about Most it or likely. whatever, and then... You know, she's obviously older. I assume she's a parent because like the parenting aspects of this film or the, the way that the parents are acting, it seems really on point. And like the humor that's in it seems very truthful. Absolutely. And it has something to say. It's positive. And overall, it's just so much better than what the advertisements make it look like it's going to be. I was annoyed with this initially anyway, because I wasn't sure if it was called like rooster blockers or cock blockers or just blockers because the poster had yeah. like a silhouette of a rooster. Yeah, right in front of blockers. Yeah, and they said blockers. So that annoyed me for a very long time. Me too. To be honest, I I watched this one, I think the day after we recorded our top five of 2018 so far episode. And I really wish I had watched it two days sooner so that I could have included it because it it would have made it under my top five. I'm not sure where, probably five-ish, but I... I really love this movie. I, I don't think I can overstate that. Wow. I, I don't think I loved it quite that much. I don't think it would have been in my top five, but it's certainly really good, and I would totally <clears throat> understand anyone who did keep it in the top five. Yeah, well, after all that praise, I'm going to have to watch <laughs> that uh, this week for sure. I, it's, I'm really excited to, to watch this movie for sure. If you want to come over and watch it, I would be down to watch it again. Yeah, let's watch Rooster Blockers. Let's do it. Cool. So... Do we have anything else we need to talk about in What's on Our Minds? I don't think so. That's it for me. I think we covered it. Okay, cool. So we're about to move into our recap of the Mission Impossible series so far. 
Before we do, we are going to go ahead and cut over to a promo from our friends at the Movies with the Misses podcast. So enjoy this promo. Hey everybody, I'm TJ. I'm Serenity. And we are Movies, Movies with, with the, the Misses. Misses. We are a podcast about catching up on the classics we've missed, the new releases, dishing on movie news, and always making fun of ourselves. Well, more making fun of you. Hey, come on now. <laughs> you could say that we are... A podcast about movie fans becoming movie fans. You can find us on all the podcast apps, including Stitcher, Spreaker, Spotify, and most importantly, iTunes. Also, hit us up on Twitter... Where you can hashtag twit at me, yo. At MWTM Podcast. Remember, take your missus to the movies before she finds a new mister you're not gonna find a new mister are you well don't test me is all i'm saying Okay, so before we go into this, we're going to be talking about all the Mission Impossible films, starting with the first one up through Rogue Nation, and we're just going to start straight in with spoilers. So if you haven't seen these films, go watch them, firstly. Indeed. Because, well, they are good. And uh, <laughs> then come back, listen to this episode, because yeah, we're, we're going to be spoiling it from now on. So the Mission Impossible series has been going on since the 90s, or at least the film series. They've all been starring Tom Cruise. So I don't think it's any secret that this franchise has had its ups and downs. But uh, what do you guys think of the Mission Impossible film franchise as a whole? Yeah, so I'll start. Okay. And I'll say that I actually didn't watch these movies for a very long time. The first time I watched any of them was to get ready to go see Ghost Protocol in theaters because oh, wow. Mike, I think you and I had gotten like IMAX tickets or whatever. And I was like, oh, I don't want to be confused. So I marathoned one through three. What was that? Seven years ago ish. Yeah. So getting ready to do this episode, I rewatched all of them again uh, with my girlfriend, which she had also not seen any of them and she really likes Tom Cruise. So we've been watching those and I got to say, I super love these movies. There's not one that I don't like. I think they get better and better and better as they go. They're just kind of getting more and more fun and enjoyable and just movies that movies that I could just watch basically like any time, you know? I feel like if anyone was like, I want to watch this Mission Impossible movie right now, I wouldn't say no, except for I'm recording a podcast right now. But, you know. Later. Sure, right after you're done, though. Yeah, they're fun. I really like that at least lately they've been going with a lot more practical stunts. Less and less of it feels like green screen CG. I feel like there's real car crashes more often than not. Yeah, we'll we'll dive into that, but that's my general thoughts on it. All right, cool. What about you, Chris? Yeah, I I really enjoy the Mission Impossible. I, I believe I've seen every single one in the theaters when it originally came out. I remember I read the Mission Impossible like companion book when it first the first movie came out, and that was a lot of fun. I'm not on board with the first two as much as Justin. I, I do really like the first one, uh, and the second one just kind of uh, loses it for me, but I think from there on, it, they just get better and better uh, for the most part. Yeah, so I, I really enjoy these quite a bit, and I, I'm really looking forward to uh, Fallout. How about you, Mike? Yeah, so I have seen every single one of these in theaters as well. I actually saw the very first one at the drive-in movie theater whenever I was... I don't know, like nine years old or eight years old or something nice. like that. Yeah. I had no idea what was going on whenever <laughs> I saw it the first time, but I was glued to the screen every time Tom Cruise would do something cool, like, uh, you know, um, when the aquarium so awesome. restaurant blows up or whenever he's like doing the infamous wire scene or yeah. the whole train sequence at the end of the first one. All of that stuff uh, was this perfect adventure film for me in the 90s. I saw the second one in theaters. I even enjoyed that one at the time. Yeah, I've seen every single one of them. I even saw, like Justin said, the Ghost Protocol uh, in the IMAX at, uh, in Austin, Texas at the Bob Bullock IMAX Theater with the Dark Knight intro or the Dark Knight Rises intro. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That, I'm jealous. I forgot that was at the beginning of that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that is probably the best movie viewing experience in a theater I've ever had is just seeing 
Ghost Protocol in true IMAX, like floor to ceiling. Like the skyscraper scene. Yeah, it's that way. It's, it's really crazy. Like those fake IMAXs that are in most areas do not do it justice. If you can, uh, see movies in true IMAX if you ever get the chance. But uh, overall, the series, I agree with Justin, it mostly just keeps getting better. I think one is better than two, but I still like two for what it is, you know? Uh, it's just a really fun franchise, lots of fun stunts, uh, which is really what I want in an action-adventure franchise, you know? I want fun stunts. And I think all of that kind of brings up one of our listener questions that we got in. Do you, one of you guys want to read that one out? Yeah, I'll go ahead and read those. So from at Films on Trial, do you think Mission Impossible is a rare example of a film series that keeps getting better as it goes on? And then should Tom Cruise do less of his own stunt work? Yeah, I definitely think since three, actually, well, I think they keep getting better, you know, from one on, but I know a lot of people think two is kind of a, a downturn, but definitely since three, I think it's kind of unanimous. They keep getting better and better. And I can't tell based on the trailer if this next one's going to be better, but I hope it is. Early word of mouth says that it is, but we'll see. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to agree. Uh, it, it, has gotten better and better the longer it goes. Do you sure. think that's a rare example? It's a key part of the question that that they say. I think like, can you think of any others? Hmm. I can't think of it. After three, this film franchise is probably the most solid franchise th- that consistently puts out good movies, uh, good to great movies. And I think, yeah, uh, it's it's probably the rarest or if not the only one that has put out su- such solid movies back to back to back. Yeah. yeah. It's not really my franchise at all. In fact, I, I don't like it, but I have heard a lot of arguments that the fast and the furious franchise doesn't really start getting good until like number five or six. And, and now ever since like fast and the furious five or six came out, that franchise is regarded as good. Yeah, I went on a whim to see one of the more recent ones, and it's it's still not good. Yeah, it's not for me, like I said, but I think that's the common consensus, right? Is that uh, the Fast and the Furious franchise does get better than it started, which isn't a hard thing to do, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, if that's true, which I've only seen the fourth one. <laughs> Don't ask me why I never watched any of the other ones, but I've only seen the fourth one, and that one's pretty bad. So if it's true that they keep getting better... They get more uh, self-aware for they, sure, like tongue in cheek. Yeah, I guess it's starting with a pretty low bar based on my experience, so it's possible. So uh, the second part of the question is: Should Tom Cruise do less of his own stunt work? Oh, right, because well, he injured himself on Fallout, right, pretty badly. I think he, yeah, he broke his ankle. I mean, I guess, I guess so for his own safety and so that he can keep making these movies so long as they're still getting better and better with him in them. You know, I want him to be around as long as they're good. So I guess so. But part of the fun of the mission impossible is the stunt work that's being done. Like I mentioned earlier that it seems like there's a lot less CG, a lot more practical stunts and with Tom Cruise, which just adds to that realism, right? You can't kind of check out because of bad stunt work or bad stuntmen or bad CG or whatever, bad green screen. Yeah, I'd agree there for sure. I want him to continue to do it because I think a lot of that's what makes Mission Impossible special uh, is the practical effects. I don't know how much of the practical effects require Tom Cruise to do it, but it's certainly fun to watch. Yeah, I agree. Um, You know, we could probably get the same movies without Tom Cruise doing the stunts or with like CGI replacing his face on some random stuntman. But that's not fun. You know, they're selling Mission Impossible Fallout mostly on Tom Cruise doing his own stunts, right? Yeah. Uh, They're able to sell the movie on that. They don't need to tell you anything about the plot. We don't care about the plot. We care because Tom Cruise is going out of his way to try harder than he needs to to entertain us. My fear (laughs) is that inevitably whenever we find out all this terrible stuff about Tom Cruise's personal life one day, that we're not going to get any more Mission Impossible movies after that because right. we'll all have to hate him because of whatever we learn about him in regards to Scientology and everything that he knew and is turning a, turning a blind eye towards, you know? Like, that's my biggest fear. I think as long as 
we like Tom Cruise and people like Tom Cruise and he wants to do these stunts to entertain us, I want to see him do it. Yeah, I am worried that they've kind of opened up Pandora's box sort of thing where they've been doing that for a while now of like pushing his stunts. And at some point, if they don't do that, the film's going to seem lesser from the get go, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's always a possibility, but uh, I think it just depends on you personally, right? Like, I guess if you're going in there and the only thing you're looking forward to is like, what stunts did he do? You may be like that, but I would argue that um, I think Rogue Nation doesn't have anything stunt-wise as impressive as MI4, but I don't think anyone like hates it significantly more that I've heard of. You know, there's one, there's one big one. I mean, I knew nothing of the plot of Rogue Nation. The only thing I knew was the big stunt that Tom Cruise did. The water it's stunt. Like I never, I never saw a trailer for it. No, the airplane. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. The airplane one's really awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty nuts. But since we're getting into film specifics, should we kind of move into talking about each film individually? Let's do it. Yeah. All right. So, Mission Impossible. That's the first one. I didn't. I I left a pause. Yeah. For clarity. Yeah. Starring John Voight, Emilio Estevez, Tom Cruise, uh, you know, others. Other people. <laughs> Is that the the one with the the lady who's in like the English Patient and I've loved you so long, Elizabeth? Kristen Scott Thomas. Yes, Kristen Scott Thomas. Thomas. There it is. So yeah, that was directed by Brian De Palma. And I guess with what do you guys think of it? Do you want to go one by one or just kind of talk generally? Uh, I'll go first. Yeah, so this is a film that is mostly um, about the espionage factor. There's only a couple set pieces that are really action-oriented. Uh, this is definitely the slowest of the entire franchise so far. This is kind of how Ethan Hunt's character in the film franchise becomes top agent, you know? He starts out, and he's just kind of like a middle-tier agent. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, everything goes terribly wrong. And he's kind of thrust into greatness through the course of the first Mission Impossible movie, you know? Yeah, he gets to rise to the occasion. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so like I said, I think this franchise just keeps getting better and better. And that goes down to the first one where this one is ultimately my least favorite. And I think part of that has to do with what you said, Mike, where it's kind of the slowest. And having not seen the Mission Impossible films until later, I think... You know, I binged them all pretty quickly together and then watched Ghost Protocol and seeing it in theater like Ghost Protocol had like the biggest impression on me. Right. So that's what Mission Impossible was in my head. So going back to revisit it, I found the first Mission Mission Impossible a little bit slow, Mm -hmm. not as much action, not as fun, even though there are some fun moments in it. Yeah, I just I think that what I've grown to like about the Mission Impossible series is just the fun interaction between the team and the really cool like action set pieces and just having a good time. And I feel like the least good time that I have is, is the first mission possible. So I'm less likely to want to watch it. It would be the last on my list of like, unless I was going to watch them in order, then it would be the first, but it would be the last <laughs> on my list of, of the mission impossible films to watch. Okay. What about you, Chris? I, I enjoy this movie. Uh, it's not my favorite. Um, I, I, uh, what I really enjoyed about rewatching it was all the technology, all the old technology. That was a lot of fun. I, you know, rewatching this. Have you guys ever seen the film Ronin by John Frankenheimer? Yeah, yeah, with uh, yeah. Jean Reno or Jean Reno. Yeah, Jean Reno. Uh, yeah, I, it reminded me a little bit of <laughs> reminded me a little bit of Ronin. Uh, it's not as good as Ronin, but I think this movie is really solid. You know, like a, a real fun movie to watch. I like Brian De Palma's direction of it. But, but yeah, good start for sure. Yeah. I think what bugs me is that some of the sort of green screen CG type stuff that's going on feels dated or we, we've surpassed it. And it's just kind of in that weird territory where it's not so antiquated that it's charming. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, but that makes sense. I don't know. Not yet. I don't know. I'll go ahead and move into my thoughts now. I, I agree with you in the sense that it's good, not great, definitely not anywhere close to the strongest in the franchise at all. But I think it ages a little better than that. I think like there's obvious like technology setbacks for like the nineties, right? Like whenever he uses the internet or uses any (laughs) kind of computer, 
it's pretty that's rough. charming <laughs> that's but, charming kind of to me kind of but overall i'd say it holds up a little a little better than than maybe what you do but then again that also could be just because i remember very distinctly when that movie was new and watching it in theaters you know so it's it's kind of hard to tell but i think uh for the time for like 90s movies uh, a lot of the special effects hold up really well like uh that whole bullet train sequence at the end like uh it looks pretty 90s right but it looks better than a lot of stuff from that time this is 96 you know i i have no doubt that it's top tier for its time yeah yeah definitely yeah so we do have a listener comment on mission impossible 1 that we wanted to talk about it's from ricky kennedy who sent us a message on twitter and his message was pretty lengthy so very lengthy we're, <laughs> yeah which we appreciate and it was a super fascinating read maybe we can post it or something with his permission so to sum up what his main point that we thought was the most interesting about mission impossible one was he was talking about how mission impossible came from a television series and jim phelps was the main character of the television series and in the movie he is played by john voight and in the movie john voight is ultimately the bad guy who's double crossed everybody and got the whole team killed and set this whole journey in motion that leads to Tom Cruise becoming the Ethan Hunt of the Mission Impossible series. Right. And uh, Ricky proposes that that is basically a betrayal to fans of the original Mission Impossible series, like fans who were excited about a movie because they love the series of taking the main character that they all love and just making him a bad guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I guess that's the question. Do, Do you guys feel that that is a betrayal? How did you feel about that? I don't, I didn't watch the TV series. I've never seen it. Right. Yeah, I never watched the TV series either. If I had, and I happened to be looking forward to this movie, I probably would have been really disappointed, right? That said, this was in the 90s whenever lots of old TV shows were being made into new movies, and um, faithfulness to the adaptation never seemed to be a big priority. I mean, they had, just in the 90s, thinking about it offhand, they had like Lost in Space, Mission Impossible... The Avengers, but not the comic book ones, you know, like the old British yeah. TV show Avengers with Uma Thurman in it. They had, you know, there were all kinds of really all over the place adaptations going on in the 90s, right? I think if the movie series were to be adapted now, Ethan Hunt's character would probably just be a version of Jim Phelps. I actually think that Brian De Palma may have been trying to say something with that casting and choosing to make the old hero the the villain um where I, because in the tv show mission impossible often t- i would say all the time the villains were always outside of the government or outside uh forces outside of our country whereas in this the villain is within and i think that he was actually trying to make a statement about see i don't know that that's true uh because a lot of it just came from Paramount giving Tom Cruise pick of the litter, being like, what do you want to adapt? What do you want to do for your production company, Cruise Wagner Productions? And he chose Mission Impossible. So I think it was Cruise that just kind of willed it into existence. And yeah, I, I mean, I think right. I don't know that De Palma ever had like a vision in mind to uh, be like, I want to say something about the main character of the original series. I think it was just Tom Cruise. Uh, being like, this is my new franchise because it was all the rage to dust off old TV shows in the 90s, you know? Yeah, so kill off the main character. Make it your own. Bring your new character. Yeah, so you're not just filling in someone else's shoes. Well, that's kind of what Ricky suggested in his in his letter as well, right? Yeah. You know, and I guess Ricky's argument is that Ethan Hunt's character kind of becomes the American version of James Bond. Like, this is Tom Cruise's new franchise that he's going to make all about himself. And in it, he goes on to say that that's why mission impossible two fails the most, which is that it becomes primarily um, just about Ethan hunt and not about the team. And what made the show so strong was the team element of the whole thing. It wasn't just about one man. It was about the team pulling a fast one over on uh, the villains through methods of espionage and spying. Yeah, and I think that's a good segue into two, if you guys want. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Yeah, I I do think real quick, there is a simple explanation where they just did that with Jim Phelps because 
no one would expect it because he was Jim Phelps and they were, it was just their attempt to go with the person that everyone would least expect as the villain. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's really simple. That's true. It's simple, but uh, yeah. I can totally understand people like Ricky being upset when they first saw it uh, because yeah. that's not the Mission Impossible brand at that time. Yeah, and- at that time, the Mission Impossible brand was just the TV show. And I would say, in my in defense of my uh, my theory, I think that all the directors have come in and put their own little thumbprint on it. I don't think Tom Cruise necessarily controls as much as you're implying there. I think that each director com- kind of comes in and puts in a new thing or adds a bit to it. So I think jumping off of what Ricky said about Mission Impossible 2, we can move into that one, right? This is the John Woo-directed Mission Impossible? Yes, and there's no team that I recall. It's basically just well, I'm, I mean, being there's cool. you get Luther, Ving Rhames' character coming in for a little bit there. He's just the team is not played up as much in Mission Impossible Two as it is in the rest of them to its detriment, right? Yeah, obviously mm-hmm. not because I forgot they were there. Yeah, there I think even was L- a team. Luther is the only character that's been in all of them. Yeah, I remember. He, I remember that about it. I remember he's in there briefly. I was thinking he just showed up maybe towards the end or something. Now, they help him during the big uh, building entering sequence in 2. Right. Yeah, so Mission Impossible 2 finds Ethan Hunt in Australia with Tandy Newton. Oh, yeah. Who is awesome. Yeah, she is. And uh, also Anthony Hopkins is here for some reason. (laughs) That's true. Forgot about that. So Cruz champions a lot of the directors that he gets for this franchise. You know, he, uh, he championed Brian De Palma. Later, J.J. Abrams and Brad Bird and Christopher McQuarrie. So I guess the same could be said of John Woo, right? He John Woo was in his prime in the 90s with Face Off, and he had just, a couple of years before, had Broken Arrow with uh, John Travolta and Christian Slater. <laughs> yeah. So he was like in the middle of his American phase in the 90s uh, when Tom Cruise found him. Because we get... John Woo as director, like you said, Chris, all, all the directors kind of put their thumbprint on these films, and I think that's probably most apparent with oh, Mission yes. Impossible 2. <laughs> oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we get a lot of the John Woo staples, a lot of slow-mo, a lot of birds. Yeah. <laughs> extravagant of, gunfights. Yeah, I was going to say extravagant choreography. Cars exploding for little to no reason. <laughs> yes. And that's one of the reasons that I really love it. <laughs> I don't want to say really love it, but I really love watching it. Like I just have a good time. Like when I step back out of it, I recognize that it's not as good as the later films, but it's it's really enjoyable. Like I think if you choose to, you can have a great time watching this movie. Yeah, I agree with that. This movie is quite silly, I, but I grew up liking John Woo in the 90s. I like Face Off, you know. I like Broken Arrow, or at least I did when I was younger. <laughs> I probably can't say that now. This movie was cool at the time. I remember I watched it a few years later after I'd saw it in theaters and thought this movie is totally ridiculous. And then for a while, I didn't like it. But now I think enough time has passed and I can look back on it and just smile at it now for its quaintness. So, yeah. you know, I'm back in the camp of just just having a blast with this movie, even though it's totally, totally silly, but not in a boring way. Like if you think it's bad and you don't want to watch it because it's going to be bad and boring that is not the case this movie is not boring yeah yeah i can agree with you guys for about the first third of the movie i enjoyed the first third of the movie with tom cruise and thandy newton and i thought that was uh a really great start to the film i I thought she was really good in it at the very beginning and she i mean she stays good in the whole thing but yeah towards the last two thirds as documented in previous episodes of uh casually criterion I'm not a big fan of John Woo, and it's just a style, and I, it's great that you guys enjoy it, and I, I'm really <laughs> happy, and I wish I did. It's just, uh, it just gets old for me sometimes, and, you know, like, cue the birds, and that's just kind of my, my take on it. <laughs> I really want to like it, but uh, I, I, I do not. In regards to Tandy Newton in it, I will say that this is also the one that has, like, the most sex appeal going on, like, the most sexual tension. I think it's the only one with a sex scene. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, that when he f- first meets Tandy Newton, uh, that was a really great scene in the bathtub. And then uh, the car chase scene where he's like kind of chasing her down and they're kind of goofing mm-hmm. around with each other in a car chase. 
Is that part of where you check out, Chris? I would say up until the part where she kind of goes, she has to infiltrate the other guys. And and once Tom Cruise and her aren't together, that's kind of where I check out, I think. Did you guys notice the really awesome homage to Alfred Hitchcock's Notorious? Not specifically. The whole uh, racetrack sequence in Mission Impossible 2 is a lot like this uh, racetrack sequence in Notorious. Oh, uh, yeah. Just a fun homage fact uh, in there. But no, I agree. The movie's really silly. The villain is, I think, the worst part of Mission Impossible 2. None of the Mission Impossibles, except for, I think, one, really has a great villain. And this I one, I think... I disagree with you. Okay. But I, I think this is the worst villain of all of them. I would agree with that. I think like he delivers lines weird. Like he overacts. Oh, like as, you mean as far as an actor, he's well, the worst villain? Actor and just... Uh, just blandness, I guess, you know? I think Jim Phelps is a more interesting bad guy than this guy. I think Philip Seymour Hoffman later is more interesting than this guy. But yeah. overall, I, I really like all the scenes with, with uh, Tandy Newton infiltrating and not being trained to, you know, like, sleep with the enemy, you know, but she's trying to do it anyway for Ethan Hunt and for, the, do, for doing the right thing, you know? I like all that. I think the action is filmed really well and it really moves it's just totally silly and john wooey yeah it's pretty well style over substance completely yeah and i think there's a motorcycle chase sequence later on in the series that blows the motorcycle chase sequence in this one out of the water i don't know about that there is a point where they play chicken with motorcycles and then both jump off their motorcycles and collide in the air (laughs) <laughs> which is super cool yeah yeah exactly so you know yeah i think it's kind of underrated i think it gets a lot more hate than it deserves and i think maybe i'm enjoying it as its own film like if you considered it not a mission impossible film i think i would enjoy it just as much i think the reason it gets hate on is because it's part of a franchise where no other film is nearly as silly or anything like it and I think that's where the hate comes from. If it was its own movie, I think people would like it more. I mean, it could be. It, we could look back on it the same way we look back on Face Off. You know, I think Face Off has its fans, even though it's totally ridiculous and silly. Yeah. So, yeah, it would be something kind of like that. You know, just some random 90s action movie uh, with a lot of slow motion and over-the-top acting. All right. So, ready to move on to Mission Impossible 3? I did want to go ahead and just mention a quick point. One of our listeners... Buddy Cattell wrote in asking, do we think this is the most auteur-friendly franchise? And I think Mission Impossible 2 answers that question for us, right? So for better or worse, I think Tom Cruise picks directors with the intention of giving them control, at yeah. least of you know the tone and the, the way it's shot, right? So I think, you know, yes, to be honest with you, I can't think of any franchise that at least not recently, that has been so uh, live or die based on the talent of the director and how well-received the director is at the time. Yeah, absolutely. I think if you look at Tom Cruise's career in general, he picks really good directors in general to work with. And I think the Mission Impossible franchise is no different. He picks the directors and lets them put their uh, fantasy on screen or their whatever they want to do and it it works it really does i guess if you compare it to like star wars where they get new directors but they just you know make them feel like star wars films you know at least like the original ones the original trilogy because they went through a couple different directors but they all feel like star wars films and they'll seem like they have kind of a a bigger hand controlling everything Mm -hmm. yeah exactly i mean this feels more different from film to film than even the bond franchise does oh totally yeah. Anyway, so to answer your question, buddy, uh, yeah, I think it is, at least right now. And, and I think the next one, Mission Impossible 3, is also a really good example of that. Like, this one just screams J.J. Abrams, for better or worse. Yeah, so let's just go ahead and move on into it. Are we ready? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I guess this is as good of a time as any to bring up another question that we got from Twitter, because I think we're all probably about to answer it. And it is from at Film Inquiry Pod which is the Film and Query Podcast Network on Twitter. And they ask, why do people like Mission Impossible 3? It looks like a TV show, has terrible CGI, and the story is downright boring. Not even Philip Seymour Hoffman could save it. Ouch. (laughs) 
So we know how they feel about Mission Impossible 3. Yeah. But and so I guess we can answer that by all talking about how we feel, I guess. Sure, I'll go first. Go on. So while I agree with you that this one looks the most like a TV show, Film Inquiry Pod, I don't agree that it's bad. I actually think uh, this is back a step in the right direction after two, right? I think this movie is solid. I think it is missing a famous set piece like all the rest of them have. Like I can think of a famous stunt or sequence in every Mission Impossible movie off the top of my head, but not this one. When this one, I think of the villain. Right, same. I think of Philip Seymour Hoffman. I think of the airplane sequence. I think of, uh, you know, the stuff in the Vatican, but nothing nothing like hanging from a rope like in Mission Impossible 1 or none of the motorcycle stuff or mountain climbing stuff from 2, you know? So I think this one is missing a big set piece that makes it iconic. But what I think is good about this one is it's a return of the team being important. The tone seems nailed down with a good blend of action and comedy. Ethan Hunt is kind of grounded back to like a normal person to some degree with like loved ones and and friends. Whereas in two, he just seemed like a Superman. Like he spends all of his free time rock climbing for some reason. Yeah. Just adrenaline junkie guy, right? This, this one makes him seem like a real person with, uh, with wants and thoughts and feelings. But uh, yeah. yeah, overall, I think this is J.J. Abrams' first movie. I think it is lacking a little bit in iconic scenes, but I think tone and everything else is perfect. But I agree that it does feel a little um, green screeny in a lot of places. Yeah, I agree with you that uh, this series is definitely where uh, – this is kind of where it picks up, where it starts getting a lot better. And I think it's because of what you talked about the grounding of Ethan Hunt and giving him an emotional through line, I think through the rest of the films, uh, which is his uh, fiance. And I think that that really gives him a good grounding and, and gives us something to root for. I do think, however, that the bridge sequence is really good uh, where they're on the bridge and they have to, they come and rescue uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Yeah. There's that famous explosion stunt. Where yeah, he, like, yeah, yeah where he bounces off the car. Yeah, yeah, and I think I would have thought about that before I watched it again, but it is definitely fresher in my memory since I just saw it this week. Yeah, but yeah, I I, I enjoy this movie, and it's it's not quite as good as Mission Impossible is gonna get, but it's it's a good step in the right direction, like you said, Mike. Yeah, I mean, what you guys said, you know, I would echo that. I will go a little bit further. I say that I think Philip Seymour, Seymour Hoffman is the best villain thus far in the series one elite, like in our countdown one through three. Right. So we haven't got to what I think is the best one or what I think has room to be the best one pending on fallout. But Felix Seymour Hoffman is a great villain in this. And I think he combined with the story with Michelle Monaghan and him getting married and her being in danger, I think is what really works about this movie and what really keeps you invested emotionally despite the lack of those big set pieces like you're talking about. There are some things that I re- really remember that stick out, you know, like a, that shot of Philip Seymour Hoffman, like going away in the helicopter from like the bridge sequence is like really iconic mm-hmm. to me that sticks in my head. And uh, the, the part where Tom Cruise is interrogating him and he like throws him into like the, the, I guess it's, I don't know what to call it exactly, but like the hole at the bottom of the plane where he's almost about yeah. to like knock him out of the plane while he's interrogating him. Lots of good stuff, I, I think. Yeah, I think it's just, but it's really fun. It's true, but I don't think that's the same kind of thing you remember when you think of the rest of the... It, it's kind of the outlier in the Mission Impossible movies in that sense, right? Because, like, at least with me, when I think of the other Mission Impossible movies, I can always think of, like, first and foremost, some crazy stunt or some yeah. kind of crazy, like, uh, sequence where Ethan Hunt has to do a mission of some right. sort, like an impossible mission. <laughs> and I think three is kind of just missing out on that whole, like, how's he going to do this moment? Which isn't inherently bad because, you know, after three movies, you want to change it up a little bit. But uh, it's just something I noticed, which is yeah. just that it it does lack that Mission Impossible moment. Yeah. Well, on the flip side, I think the other films lack the the sort of emotional character heart 
moments as much like other than bits and pieces in some of them um they don't have like that same attachment and emotion going on where like his wife is in danger right they kind of forgo all that in the later ones where it then becomes about you know actually just like saving the people or the world or whatever from the bad guy sure but in my opinion i think that makes it a stronger series going forward instead of trying to recapture the same thing they did in three again with the right. same character, like it would have been kind of like an annoying character if she was just always needing saving, you know? Right. For sure. I, I totally agree with that. I think it's a bit like the director thumbnail or what makes this one like unique mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. stand out. And I, I don't think in any sort of bad way, I think that's what makes this particular film memorable. Yeah, absolutely. So are we ready to move into ghost protocol? Yeah. Definitely. So yeah, Mission Impossible, Ghost Protocol. As soon as you start watching this movie, uh, I watched them all this week, which I've said before, but I feel like you can tell a difference. Like if Mission Impossible 3 is a 6, this jumps all the way up to an 8 or a 9. There's a, a, a vast difference. And Mission Impossible 3 being really good, but and man, as soon as you start watching it, it just pulls you in. The, the visuals are uh, really amazing. And there's so much happening at any one given time, but you're able to track it very well. Like Ethan Hunt's doing something and Jeremy Renner's doing something and every, but you're able to track it so easily through the directing and know where everybody is and know what everybody's doing. Uh, it's just um, a really good movie. I like this one a lot. What about you, Justin? Yeah, same. So as I said earlier, this was the first one that I saw in theaters and I, kind of binge the first three and then watch this one. And this one was like, holy crap to me when I watched it, I thought, and that might've been the IMAX experience the as part of it, but it just blew me away. Like even compared to the first three, I, th- I think this one is better than three. It starts out just like super and in- super intense. And it has Josh Holloway in it who plays Sawyer and oh, Lost, yeah, yeah. which is one of my favorite TV series. And so I was hooked on that too even though he doesn't stick around very long. Yeah, I I think this one really puts the fun into the Mission Impossible series and really focused on that. Like the whole um, skyscraper sequence is so fun and Simon Pegg really gets his chance to just shine like a big, bright, shining star in this. I think he's great. He's like that spice that makes the dish of the film just like it kicks it up a whole notch, right? Yeah, Simon Pegg adds so much to these films, and I think that's one of the reasons these are better films. Yeah, so Mike, what about you? Yeah, so I'm right there with you. I saw this, like we said earlier, in the IMAX screening, which was amazing, seeing it in true IMAX. Um, just from the opening shots with like the rooftops, and it zooms in, then all of a sudden Josh Holloway's character busts out of that door. And it's all in IMAX, and you can just see so much detail in the screen. Yeah, that whole section where he's he's running, he jumps off the roof, and he has that inflatable thing that pops up and saves him before he <laughs> lands. <laughs> and like the assassin, uh, you know, popping up on his phone. It's like the whole thing just lets you know that you are in a like, fantasy spy world from get from the the get go, right? And you know, this is even more hokey and spy-y than it has been since the first one. Um, you know, I think one of the things I really liked about the first Mission Impossible was the first few minutes you get to see them on their mission, the way it's supposed to be, right? Before everything goes wrong. And, you know, three has a little bit of like the team trying to pull off a spy mission in the Vatican stuff, but that's what I really love about these movies is is the team and everyone has a job, everyone's doing something to make the mission happen. And the whole skyscraper sequence not even the part where tom cruise is just hanging on on the outside of the building but even the whole uh sequence in the rooms where they're trying to um pull a fast one on the bad guys and they're trying to fool them into giving the nuclear launch codes and it's just great you know it's cutting back and forth between two different rooms there's two different sets of espionage going on at once you know one can't complete their mission until the other completes their mission in another room it's just great. Totally suspenseful. Awesome. Awesome direction. And yeah, I think it's just a complete blast. I think Jeremy Renner was a good addition. I'm glad they didn't try to make him like Ethan Hunt part two. Right. I was kind of worried whenever I first saw it that he was going to be 
prepped to take over the franchise once Tom Cruise got too old. I'm looking at you, born identity. Yeah, yeah. Now I don't think that uh, Tom Cruise has any intention of giving up this franchise. Anyway, I think Brad Bird was a great addition. This was his first live action movie. Um, I think he was completely up to the challenge and, you know, almost indisputably, the building sequence in Mission Impossible 4 uh, in Ghost Protocol has become one of the most famous set pieces of any movie. You see it cited everywhere, him on the side of that building. So, you know, regardless of your thoughts on it, I think it's just, I think that building sequence is just as iconic as Tom Cruise hanging in the vault room in Mission Impossible 1, you know, in that white room. I think that whole set piece is the best part of this whole series so far. Yeah, it's just iconic in every sense of the word. And it has my favorite moment in the whole series so far too. And it's right after Tom Cruise is on the outside and he finally like swings into the open window and falls down and Simon uh-huh. Pegg comes in and he's just finished like changing the door numbers on yeah, the doors like, outside. That was not easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that wasn't easy or whatever. Yeah. Like, yeah. and that whole thing is an example of like going from suspense to comedy and having it be so well balanced and well timed and like uh, put it to the director of being like paced, you know, masterfully. To that statement and to what Mike was saying earlier, the two things that are going on in the different rooms, the exposition to explain what is happening in each room and how they have to get it done is goes by so quickly and you almost take the information in without realizing you're taking that information in to know how they got to solve the the puzzle, right? Yeah. And it's just really good. Uh, you're not bored by exposition as they explain it for sure. I was watching a lot of the making ofs on YouTube this week for all these movies. And one of the making ofs for Ghost Protocol, Brad Bird was talking about how one of the things he really wanted to add to the spy genre was having their equipment stop working on them. And that's like, that's one thing he really wanted to do, which is like to have them relying on their equipment and then have the equipment break and then have to improvise after that. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that has a lot to do with it as well. Like, uh, a lot of the gadgets and stuff they use in Ghost Protocol are some of my favorite gadgets in the series. And then it's always fun to see when those gadgets then stop working, right? Like that whole gadget at the beginning when Ethan Hunt and Simon Pegg's character are in the hallway. Yeah, like the giant camera screen thing. Yeah, yeah. And it, like it finds the, the guard's eyes and adjusts the perspective to where it always looks like he's looking down an empty hallway. Uh, and it projects it on the screen. And it's just so cool. And the amount of comedy that they glean out of it is awesome like they have the whole bit where simon Pegg is really close to the camera and doesn't realize it so his face is just like the size of the hallway from like the guard's (laughs) perspective but he's not looking and what happens whenever multiple people walk up and it tries to sync to multiple eyes at once like exactly that's all very funny yeah i agree and so yeah it's a return to the espionage spying stuff that i think was really prominent in, in the first mission impossible yeah i think the one thing that I will say, and we kind of talked about it earlier is the villain in this one. I can't remember there being a specific bad guy, like villain. I remember there's the girl, Leah Sedu, who plays the assassin, Mm -hmm. but she's just kind of a henchman. And there's the guy that gets the numbers, but he's not like particularly involved or it was that like a person who's just getting the numbers for someone else. I can't remember. The main villain is the guy from the girl with the dragon tattoo. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't remember the, his name. the Swedish version, Michael Mikhail Nykvist or something like that. Yeah, that's it. But uh, yeah, he's not the best villain, and not through any fault of his. It's just he's just a generic guy after a briefcase with nuclear launch codes or something, you know? Yeah, yeah he's just not doing man. a lot. No, he's not. But he doesn't really have time to do a lot. The rest of this movie is primarily focused on Hunt and his team, you know. I see, and I, I would, I guess, kind of argue. You said, Mike, that Mission Impossible Two villain is the weakest or the worst villain. I think in performance, you're probably right, but I don't know. Just this one, this one might be like the weakest villain in terms of plot and story to me. Yeah, you're you're probably right about that. Uh, thinking back on it, because at least I remember some scenes with the guy from Mission Impossible Two. Like, there's that one scene where he. Uh, Candy Newton walks up to him in Mission Impossible 2 and he like grabs her scarf in a really dramatic way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember what I'm talking Slow about? Motion. Yeah. yeah. That's more yeah. memorable than anything the guy in, in uh, Ghost Protocol does. Yeah. I think it's the one weak point of this film and in an otherwise damn near perfect movie. 
Yeah, I agree with that. I think that's the one thing this really glaringly missing is just a really compelling villain. Yeah. So anybody got anything else on Ghost Protocol before we move to Rogue Nation? Nope. Nope. I'm ready. All right. So Mission Impossible Rogue Nation. This is the first one directed by Christopher McQuarrie, who is returning for Mission Impossible Fallout. And this actually is rare because the villain in Rogue Nation is actually going to be the villain in Fallout again. Yeah. This is the first first time time this has happened. Yeah. Which will be interesting to see how that works. Yeah. Yeah. It's better off, too. Yeah, I think so. I think it's the right time in this franchise to do more of a sequel. I think that's probably the smart thing to do. You don't want each and every one of them to be so standalone. So I think this one could do a lot to uh, to kind of make the whole series feel a- a one piece, you know? Yeah, mm-hmm. that makes sense. Yeah, so Christopher McQuarrie, I think he was a great addition to the Mission Impossible franchise. I think Rogue Nation has a lot of scenes that are my favorite scenes in the franchise. I don't think it's quite as good as Ghost Protocol just because there's nothing quite as impressive as that building sequence. But what is here is really good. But the whole underwater sequence, I think, is so good. I wish it didn't cut away. I wish it stayed in like in one shot so we could kind of like follow Ethan Hunt through the whole thing. But the scene where like Ethan Hunt passes out underwater, then you see Ilsa Faust basically just come out of nowhere and save Ethan Hunt underwater, right? And that that shot gets me so pumped when it happens. Like, the music and the editing, everything is just so great. She looks so cool when she comes in to save him. This is the first time in the franchise that we get a female version of Ethan Hunt. That's his equal at that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That uh, in more than one occasion, Tom Cruise gets one-upped in this movie. And usually these movies are just a whole showcase for how cool can Tom Cruise be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I, I really appreciate in this one that Tom Cruise isn't afraid to let Rebecca Ferguson take over and just be cooler than him for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe she'll take over the franchise. I would be okay with that, man. Like uh, Tom Cruise can't keep doing this forever <laughs> or maybe he can. I don't know. Tom, uh, Harrison Ford's <laughs> still doing stunt work into his eighties. <laughs> well, if she takes over, then they could name the movie Mission Impossible, and it'd be MRS period Shun Impossible. No, is that? Yeah, a- that'd be really good. Yeah, it's. <laughs> it sounds like a winner in my head. Yeah, what could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> so for me, I actually did not see Rogue Nation in theaters, even though I wanted to. I just, I think I was working on my film for grad school at the time, and it was just completely bogged down. And I regret it, man, because some of these action sequences, because this was also done in IMAX, right? Yeah. Yeah. Super regret it, because some of these scenes seem like they'd be just as fun to see in theaters as some of the Ghost Protocol ones were. And I think what this one has that makes me like it just a little bit more than Ghost Protocol, I will say, you know, I said earlier that the films just keep getting better. I think this one gets just a little bit better than Ghost Protocol. Not much. I'd really hate to have to live on the difference. They're truthfully about equal, but this one just has like the villain that to me is so good. I think this guy is so uniquely creepy and weird. I just, I I, I love having that, that villain in there to almost feel like a second character, right? To almost like carry some of the load of the movie, right? Whereas in Ghost Protocol, that's not happening. And no. I like that it starts out with Ethan Hunt getting caught immediately. Right? Like, that's kind of the opening. Well, after mm-hmm. the whole airplane sequence, we get Ethan Hunt getting tricked and duped by the villain. So, he, like, it automatically sets this villain up as able to outsmart Ethan Hunt. Right? Mm-hmm. I think that just sets the tone for the whole thing. And it's it's really fun. I, I can't talk in too much detail because I've, I've only seen this one once as opposed to all the other ones I've seen twice. So, there's a lot of spots I don't quite remember. But mm-hmm. I remember just absolutely loving it. Yeah, uh, I'm going to echo what both of you guys have said, <laughs> but this is uh, really hard to decide which one I like more, four or five. Um, it, it's really good. Uh, the addition of Rebecca Ferguson is amazing, like you were saying, Mike. Uh, the opera sequence may, in my mind, rival the the building sequence in four. I think that the opera sequence is great. It doesn't have the height stuff going on, but... Oh man, it, everything is happening. Or there's like three characters that it's were beautifully tracking. edited. 
Yeah. yeah. And we know where everybody is. We know when Simon Pegg is headed towards uh, this the one bad guy. And, and it's just so great. And Rebecca Ferguson's um, dress. Yeah, it's it's awesome. I really like that opera sequence, and it's it's that alone is worth the fifteen dollars or whatever to go see it in IMAX. I think, or just watching in the theaters, it's so great. Yeah, that's great. And Mike, you mentioned the underwater thing. Like my anxiety just watching it at home was like through the roof during that scene where he's holding his breath. And yeah. like, did you know Tom Cruise uh, trained to hold his breath for like five or six minutes to do this? Really? Yeah. Like I oh. watched. I watched the making of of like every single Mission Impossible movie, right? And every single one of those making ofs, like whoever was in charge of the stunts for that particular movie, without fail, they were always like, yeah, Tom Cruise is insane. He learned how to do this in like two days. And it seems like they did that with every kind of stunt that Tom Cruise learned how to do, whether it be like jumping in the air and kicking something, riding a motorcycle, holding Mm -hmm. your breath. It seems like the man can just learn how to do any kind of stunt within like three or four days is, is what they make it sound like on these like Weird. videos these featurette videos i i imagine the stunt directors for these movies like lose years off their lives worrying about tom cruise hurting himself <laughs> right yeah. one of these imagine stunts. the people with <laughs> money and things on the line and like the insurance yeah. companies well, they talk about it they say that uh there's normally this would never happen like they would never let the star do these kinds of stunts but tom cruise actually gives up a lot of his salary for these movies and agrees to take some of like the the gross like off the back end, just so that like they can like afford to let Tom Cruise <laughs> make <laughs> the stunts that he wants to make, you know? Yeah, wow, amazing. So it, he takes it seriously. Like he prides himself in his stunt work, and you know they're all like featurettes on YouTube, so I'm sure they're not going to put anything in there of like a stunt guy being like Tom Cruise sucks. But <laughs> <laughs> that arrogant asshole takes my job. Yeah, that said, they all seem very impressed with how just natural uh, Tom Cruise is at just getting trained for these stunts in time. Yeah, Yeah. it's awesome. Yeah, so if I'm being critical of Rogue Nation, I like it probably about as much as Ghost Protocol. I wouldn't, I think I like Ghost Protocol more, like I said, but with Rogue Nation, I think one thing that I wasn't super keen on is i am getting a little tired of ethan hunt going rogue yeah (laughs) i was gonna make that comment at the end of talking about all of them is like this one they kind of do it differently like he's going rogue at the very beginning and they're like this is ethan hunt's last day as a free man and then it's like six months later (laughs) and they haven't caught him yet so like they make it feel different than going rogue let's say in uh, ghost protocol but it's still if you take a step back you're like wait a minute come on yeah. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Chris. At at this point, we really have to question if he actually works for the IMF or not, because he spends more time not working for the IMF than he does working for the IMF. Right? They've disavowed him so many times at this point. <laughs> yeah, maybe. So hopefully, uh, Mission Impossible Fallout, if they go rogue, it's handled in such a way to where it's uh, feels different, and I yeah, don't recognize yeah. it until the movie's over, like I did with Rogue Nation. Isn't that a line like in the trailer? Doesn't Alec Baldwin or someone say like his country's disavowed him so many times? What do you what do you think's going to happen if they do it again or something like that? Well, there's one point where like Henry Cavill's there and he's like, "If you go rogue, his whole job is to like kill you or whatever." Yeah, he hunts down the rogue guys. So I'm, I have a good guess that he, that's what's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like why why create a character whose job it is is to track down rogue agents if no one's going to go rogue? <laughs> So yeah, I think we're in for that, but maybe they'll catch on that uh, that is a little tiresome because I agree. Well, I mean, I think just adding that character in the trailers, the Henry Cavill character, is like their way of letting us know that they know that Ethan Hunt goes rogue way too much. <laughs> yeah, that they've started hiring special people for it. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, they, that was <laughs> the one in the interviews. Like, do you think you can catch Ethan Hunt? And they're like, yeah, yeah, I probably could. And no, so you're hired. You know, yeah, like they that just have a whole task they, force for Ethan Hunt. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> Is that it for Rogue Nation? Anybody got anything else? Nope. I am excited to see the return of this villain and Rebecca Ferguson's character in Five, or excuse me, in Fallout. Uh, although there's going to be no Jeremy Renner. Sad. Wait. He was busy not filming any scenes for Avengers uh, yeah. 3. <laughs> 
Maybe he had those broken arms from Tag. Maybe. But if they know. could uh, CGI his arms and Tag, surely they could come up with something for Rogue Nation. No, but I, I actually hear that um, it was the filming of Avengers 4 that stopped him from being in this one. Spoiler kind of alert. A bummer. Yeah. Okay, so moving on, we have a listener question from Facebook from Jerry Hart, and he asks, who's your favorite villain? We all kind of talked about this a little bit, but do we just want to definitively go through and say? Yeah. Yeah. I think I already stated it. You guys, I think, are a little bit more oblique, but yeah, Philip Seymour Hoffman's my favorite villain for sure. Yeah, despite what the Film Inquiry podcast says, I think Philip Seymour Hoffman does elevate Mission Impossible 3, but I think the villain in Rogue Nation could be a close second, depending on how Fallout goes. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. You know, in a week, we could caveat this for sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We'll see how Fallout goes, but I think the one from Rogue Nation, even without Fallout, is the best there you have it so i guess now uh should we bust out the rankings yeah that sounds good let's let's do the listener poll all right so we sent out a poll on twitter and facebook that said before fallout hits theaters which is the best mission impossible film so i also want to say that we all participated in this right did you guys all vote yeah we all voted voted and then you know, uh, apparently a bunch of other people voted too. We actually yeah. had a pretty good turnout on this poll. Yeah. So wh- while we didn't rank them in this episode, our rankings are incorporated into this poll. Indeed. So can you guys guess which one has the highest percentage? Is it Mission Impossible 2? You got it. No. Yes. Um, Nailed it. <laughs> yeah. So the highest rated Mission Impossible is Ghost Protocol with 42%. Wow. Yeah. The next one would be Mission Impossible Rogue Nation with 31%, which is a huge drop. 31 to 42, though. Uh, The next one is Mission Impossible, the first one, with 13%. Then Mission Impossible 3 with 10%. And then Mission Impossible 2 with 4%. No. Indeed. (laughs) So, yeah, my rankings line up pretty much probably with these. Although, depending on the day of the week, you could probably switch Rogue Nation and Ghost Protocol around, depending on how I'm feeling. Yeah, I'm glad we didn't rank, because I didn't want to have to choose between those two. Yeah. It's like a Sophie's Choice. <laughs> yeah, just oh, like my. that. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right, so to round out this episode, we have one last listener question. Are you guys ready? I know yeah. I am. So this one is from the IMDb Journey podcast on Twitter, who are at IMDb Journey. They ask... Three questions, or it's kind of a three-parter. How long do you think the franchise will go on? What's the number of films they'll finish up on? And also, what will be the subtitle for the last film? Hmm, interesting. Yeah. So I I guess the question is, will they keep doing films after Tom Cruise? And do we count those, or do we just say how many they're going to make with Tom Cruise? Hmm, that's interesting as well. I think they'd have to reboot. If Tom Cruise left, unless they use the same characters, obviously. Yeah, I think they could potentially reboot this into eternity. So I feel like we should just like, when when are they going to end with Tom Cruise? Tom Cruise. Yeah, let's do yeah. that. So, so I would say... He's 51 now, right? He's 56. Whoa. Yeah, so he's 56. So how long can he do these movies? Like, I think he could grow out of the stunts maybe a little bit. Like, he could be the team leader a little bit more um, as opposed to doing the stunts or he could have a stunt double do him. So I think a good 20 more years <laughs> uh, as long as nothing, you know, harmful befalls him. Yeah. I would say he could probably go as long as he wants to. He's obviously aging very well. He could probably do this franchise probably for another 10 years if he wanted to and maybe get two more movies out from under his belt. I don't know if He would or not, especially after breaking his ankle. I don't know if the studio is going to keep allowing him to, but I think they can generally be pretty careful with stunts. You know, you have Harrison Ford doing stunts into his old age, you know, and Tom Cruise is uh, in better shape than Harrison Ford. So, you know, I, I believe that probably Tom Cruise could, he probably has at least two or three more Mission Impossibles in him if he wants to. Yeah, I think so. And yeah, that's also I'm, if the ball doesn't drop and we don't all start hating Tom Cruise before then. I still think that's going to happen. <laughs> Barring that, I, I'm going to go bold and say he's going to do four more and the 10th one will be the last one with Tom Cruise. They'll, they'll go for like an even 10. They'll, it'll be Mission Impossible 
I guess I'll do the subtitle one, but it'll be Mission Impossible X, right? <laughs> that, that'll be it. Okay, I don't think yeah. they'll subtitle it. I think it'll be Mission Impossible X. And if they do subtitle it, they'll play off of the X. So it'll be like, they'll, he'll have like a Michelle Monaghan, though. I guess they're divorced, right? We don't these, know. Well, we don't really know, I guess. I say he'll divorce her, marry again, get divorced, and it'll be called Mission Impossible X-Wives. <laughs> <laughs> and Let, let's hope not. For action. <laughs> And it'll be, uh, yeah, it'll be them banding together to save Tom Cruise. <laughs> so yeah, I would, I say that you're pretty did on about, you know, three to four more movies. Uh, if I was going to pick the subtitle, it would be Mission Impossible: The Geriatric Club, and they would just play like backgammon, and uh, they would do little missions in the nursing home, and I think that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> I think the the last one should be called. Uh... Mission Impossible, fly away home. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll get Anne pa- uh, Anna Paquin in it uh-huh. and with the geese. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Jeff Daniels. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Yeah. But Mission Impossible, I-30. I don't know, bingo. <laughs> Mission Impossible, that's a bingo. And Christoph Waltz will be in it or something. I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying. Really, you could just put any word in. Like, Mission Impossible, like... Uh... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> trying to think. I've gone blank. <laughs> Mission Impossible Viagra. No, that would be weird. Because, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They've only had one sex scene, and that was John Woo. So we'd have to get someone John Woo ish in there. No, oh, please don't do that. All, All right. right. <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's good. I think we've exhaustively talked about the Mission Impossible films. So yeah, thanks for listening. And thanks, as always, to Jake Wagner Russell for doing our intro and outro music. You can hear more of his music at soundcloud.com slash bopscotch. And also, I wanted to thank everyone who sent in messages, questions, comments for us to do on this episode. I'll just quickly read them off. We had Films on Trial, Ricky Kennedy, Buddy Cattell, Film and Query Podcast, Jerry Hart, and the IMDb Journey Podcast. Thank you guys for sending in your questions. We loved them. Yeah, thanks so much, guys. Thanks a lot. Makes the show more interesting. Yeah. All right. So don't forget to check out our poll on Facebook and Twitter for which theme you would like us to choose for our next Casually Criterion episodes or episode. Yeah. So our last episode, we picked three themes, one each. And so you get to vote on which theme we go with for our next Casually Criterion episode. So go vote now. Remember, a vote for me is a vote for fun. And a vote for me is a vote for pun. Ugh. And if you don't get that listen to the last episode all right so join us next time our next episode will be over mission impossible fallout and don't forget to follow us on facebook twitter and instagram at casual cinecast and also don't forget to leave us a five-star itunes review and a review that really helps people find the show easier helps us grow the show get more great listener questions like we had today and also subscribe to us in your podcast app whatever one you prefer to use yeah thanks so much for listening guys uh we'll see you next time Bye-bye. See you later.